Hello and welcome to Community Conversation, a show that's for and about the people who live in Reading. My name is Kevin Vent and I'm going to be your host for this episode. And in this episode, we're looking at issues that are dealing with seniors. Our Kevin Walsh will be talking to Paul Redfern, a certified financial planner. But first, he's talking to attorney David Huey. Let's look into that conversation now. Hi, everybody, and welcome. I'm here with attorney David Hoy, and we're talking about a number of different senior issues. I asked Dave to, to first of all, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself? Oh, sure. Uh, I've been an attorney for over 20 years. I practice in elder abuse, elder neglect, uh, education to the public about elder issues. Uh, I live in North Reading. My practice is based out of North Reading, covers all of Massachusetts and other New England states. You know, there's so much to talk about as, as people get, you know, get older, there's issues. I have issues with my parents. Could we start perhaps in uh, talking the difference between assisted living and nursing homes? Well, there's the uh, public's perception of what the difference is, and then there's the legal element. Let's start with the legal element. The legal element between nursing home and assisted living is assist, uh, nursing homes are regulated by both the federal and state government for the care, protection, and safety of elderly. Assisted living facilities are not regulated by the federal government, and they are regulated by certain states. Massachusetts, they are regulated, but those regulations are paper thin, and they are not sufficient enough to hold assisted living facilities accountable if something happens. The other core difference is how they're staffed. An assisted living facility doesn't necessarily have nursing around the clock or uh, a physician assigned to the building. That may all be independent if you want that. Whereas in a nursing home, those things are available to you 24-7. You know, this is such a, a confusing uh, thing. You know, there's assisted living, there's memory care, there's uh, of independent living, you know, I hear about so much of it, it, you know, it's hard to kind of figure out how can we tell the good ones from the bad ones? <laughs> Not easy. In the nursing home world, uh, the nursing homes are rated. They're rated by the state and the federal government. So you can look up through the Department of Public Health website, search a nursing home, check the nursing homes within your community, and they're going to be issued a report card by the state. For instance, for example, before I came here today, I looked up Wingate of Reading, a skilled nursing facility licensed by the Commonwealth. They had a report card score of a 125. The best score you can get is a 132. The state average is a 124. So Wingate at Reading is an above average quality of care nursing home facility. That's how you need to look it up. That's where you start. Assisted living facility, no rating system yet. So, you know, if we're trying to figure out, if we're putting, uh, you know, or helping someone get into an old, you know, or, I can't even use the correct words here, the, the uh, assisted nursing facility, um, what, what kind of things should we look for? Well, one, you have to visit it, and you should visit it more than, more than once. You got to ask the right questions. So when you're sitting down with the administration, you got to ask simple questions like, have you ever been sued for neglect or abuse? What was the outcome of those cases if you were? What's your turnover rate? What's the staff morale? What's the management turnover rate? You're looking for longevity in both the management and the staff. Now those are pretty, you know, pretty personal questions if they're a business owner up there. Are they obliged to answer those questions? They are. Is, is that law? Under the Code of Massachusetts regulations, the consumer on the consumer protection rights has a, the right to know those type of issues. Hmm. And there are postings. So uh, each nursing home is inspected by the Department of Public Health once a year. Mm -hmm. That inspection report or deficiency report, is, if they've been hit with a deficiency, has to be posted in a place for the public and residents to see. Now here in Reading, we have a number of different, you know, what I think are wonderful places, Wingate, Sanborn, Pearl Street, and pardon me if I, if I don't remember the other ones, um, but each one of those, would, there would be a way to find out about them. Correct. Okay, and I know they're all a little bit different. Yep. Now moving on to a kind of different subject, Alzheimer's versus dementia mm -hmm. versus senility, I mean, it, there's so many different terms. W let's just talk w about Alzheimer's uh, and dementia. Okay. What is the difference? Sure. In my world, there is no difference. 
It's a memory impairment. It's a memory loss for in the medical world or in the assisted living or nursing home world, there's, there's a big difference. Uh, and I can talk about that in, in a second. In the medical world, the dementia is the beginning stages that may lead or may not lead to dementia, but it's a short-term memory loss. Mm -hmm. They can still recognize you or your loved ones or people or the caregivers. They probably may know where they are, but they may not remember who the President of the United States is. Right. Uh, they're starting to lose activities of daily living, walking, grooming, eating, bathing. Uh, Alzheimer's is a diagnosed disease of the brain. It is the brain tissue that is dying and you start to lose motor skills. You become incontinent. Maybe you stop eating. You definitely stop thinking, uh, recognizing faces, unable to communicate. So in the medical world, it's, it's the, the brain tissue that is decomposing and dying. Dementia, it's not there yet, but you're starting the memory loss issues. So a, they can physically identify the difference. It sounds to me the, the way you were talking about the brain, they would yeah. do a brain scan and they would be able to tell that it was Alzheimer's versus dementia. I yeah. see. That's how they make the diagnosis. And then that determines the level of care that someone may or, or may need. Mm -hmm. Now, what are some of the things, I mean, we hear about this stuff all the time, but we should have our, our documents ready, our powers of attorney, our health care proxies. Maybe you could talk about those a little bit. Also, one of the things near and dear to my heart is, uh, is there a, not just a health care process, a, a living will in Massachusetts, whether or not it, it works, whether or not that should be one of your four or five key documents? Well, I could tell you from example. So I usually get a call after an elder has been abused or neglected. And one of the issues that comes up is, the decision to put your loved one in an assisted living facility or nursing home, how did that come about? Why did that come about? And was there a power of attorney? Was there a health care proxy? Was there even an estate plan set up before your loved one went into a nursing home or assisted living facility? Eight out of ten times, the answer is no. Is that right? And that causes all sorts of complications. Right. So here we are with the baby boomer age who still have some parents. World War II generation parents in their 80s, 90s, close to 100 years old. And here they are themselves in their 60s and 70s and still no estate plan, no power of attorney, no health care proxy. So God forbid something happens, which is going to require you to be in assisted living or even a hospital or, or nursing home. And there's no one making your health care decisions, no one making your financial or legal decisions because you don't have a power mm -hmm. of attorney and you have multiple children, it becomes a major, major problem. These things need to be done. They need to be done now while you're competent to make those the decisions. decisions. Yeah, and I, and I can appreciate that because, you know, for me personally, uh, I'm not sure my mother, who's suffering from early Alzheimer's, I'm not sure she could be legally competent to make that decision right now. Yeah. Um, you know, so we talked a little bit about the will. We know what that does. The power of attorney gives someone else the ability to make financial decisions for you. And legal. And legal. Yes. The um, health care proxy, that makes, let me see if I understand this right, uh, that makes it so that you, someone could make medical decisions for you. Health care decisions, sure. Now, finally, there's the living will. Um, I always hear this uh, thing about living wills where some of your final decisions you perhaps made before, while, of course, while you're competent. Um, is that valid in Massachusetts, living wills? Uh, it, it's all a play on words. It's just a will. Yeah. Okay. And even in the will, you can say whether you want to be left on tubes or have, you know, tubes taken out. Um, whether you want a DNR is probably a better document that Very needs good. to be addressed. Absolutely. Um, a will, a general will. We all know what wills are. It's a way of where you want to leave your assets or your personal belongings or things that are dear to you to whatever loved ones or right. friends or family that you have. Uh, DNR is probably the better document to be talking about. Very good. You know, do, do not, not resuscitate. resuscitate. Yeah. There's also one called uh, do not hospitalize. You know, right. hospitalization, whether that you're in a situation and you don't want to be hospitalized. You know, that's very important, and of course, I think it helps the people left behind who are making those decisions. Uh, you know, it's such a. I know that it, you know, in some of the things that I do, I encourage people to try to to get going on that so that nobody so that somebody else isn't making your decisions for you. 
Uh, I mean, some of the litigation that you get must get involved with with nursing homes. Uh, tell me a little little bit about that. Yeah. We have about two more minutes. Sure. Uh, unfortunately, I usually get the call after an elder has been abused and neglected, and it just so happens to be the majority of the time it's in a nursing home or an assisted living facility. Uh, it, it's all ranges: falls, fractures, head traumas, sexual assaults. Elopements. Elopements are when they wander away from the facility. Oh, uh, they froze to death, been hit by a car, all sorts of things. Unbelievable. Um, you know, I've heard you know some of the stories. Um, you know, is there are, are there other examples of uh, things that you have seen in nursing homes that you know? I guess I want to get back to that to talk about it. That you know, I should be looking for, or that you know, or That's somebody else might be looking for. Yes. There's a major piece to this. Um, because the nursing home and assisted living facility industry knows that an elder within their care will be abused or neglected at some point in time, they just don't know when, that when you're putting a loved one into an assisted living or nursing home, they have what's called an arbitration clause. Mm -hmm. It's a document within the admission paperwork that you lose your right to go to a jury if you are abused or neglected. Is that legal? They're legal if they are entered into like a contract mm -hmm. where there's an offer and meeting of the minds. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not legal if they're done through duress mm -hmm. or fraud of some sort. What I need to educate the public about is if you're faced with one of these arbitration clauses in a nursing home agreement or, or assisted living facility admission packet, they're not mandatory. They're not conditional upon putting your loved one in there. You don't have to sign them. Mm. You can actually cross them out. Well, there's so much to learn when it comes to assisted living facilities and uh, nursing homes. Um, I'm glad you're here to be able to tell me a little bit about it. Uh, this is attorney David Hoy, and uh, we're here on Community Conversation. So I hope uh, other issues like this we get to talk about again future in the future. Dave, thank you for joining me. Oh, you're welcome. The only thing you can really do at the end of the day is compare a guy to his contemporaries. Right. It's hard to compare Brady to Terry Bradshaw. The game was different in the 70s than it is now. They've won something like 15 or 16 more games than any other team in the NFL yep. in that span of time. Luck looks like an NFL quarterback. I remember I called everyone I knew when they when they uh, traded for Garnett. Um, that was just one of the most amazing things <laughs> of my life. <laughs> if John Farrell could fix John Lester, then your pitching problem is partially solved. Kareem had that one unstoppable shot, the sky hook, and he milked it for, what, 35,000 points or something like that. Just, again, versatility, Mr. Patriot. Yeah. If you needed something, he's going to get it done. I am to this show as Alex Baldwin is to SNL. So. <laughs> this is the infamous Jason Barrett that shoves uh, his glove yes. right into Alex Rodriguez's face. <laughs> Welcome back to Community Conversation. Next up, Kevin Walsh is going to talk to certified financial planner Paul Redfern. With me here today is Paul Redfern. Paul is a certified financial planner. Paul and I met the other day and we struck up a conversation that we wanted to share with you. Now, what Paul and I are both certified financial planners. We're both a little bit experts on, on personal finance. And we started this conversation about, like, what would you do what would you suggest to a 70-year-old uh, woman or 70-year-old man for a conservative investment these days? Now, before we get into this conversation, Paul, why don't you introduce yourself and maybe talk a little bit about some of the compliance issues that we have to deal with in this crazy world? Very good. As Kevin said, I'm Paul Redfern from Redfern Financial and Insurance Services in Woburn. Um, there are a number of disclosures when you're securities based, but I think we're going to keep it pretty generic today so uh, we won't run afoul of uh, specific <laughs> compliance laws. Well, again, we're here for educational purposes. Um, we want to make sure this isn't self-serving in any way. My disclosure would be, you know, once you get into um, 
stocks, bonds, anything other than just a CD that's insured by the federal government, uh, we have to say things like you could lose, you could lose money, uh, you could lose value, you, you could lose principal. There's a hundred different disclosures about that, and we'll do that again at the end. Uh, but let's talk about, first of all, what a certified financial planner is. Do you have any thoughts? Absolutely. We, um, we have a particular process we utilize to, to clients of all ages, whether they're in retirement, whether they're not even thinking about retirement, but to help focus them, to help get a good understanding of where they stand right now, help them develop where they want to be, what their financial goals are specifically. And then, and then, like I said, develop a plan to get them where they need to be, but all along the way, looking at other issues that come Absolutely. into play, estate planning, any a number of issues that over the course of time happen. You know, uh, I heard a radio announcer recently talk about uh, a certified financial planner, the designation. Uh, you have to study for a year. Uh, it's, uh, it is really the gold standard for, uh, for, you know, what you should, the minimum criteria that you should have for a financial planner. And, uh, and I like the way that she put it. She said, just, you know, if you're going to do some financial planning, just make sure you have a CFP. But let's move on from there. The question when we, when we met the other day was, what could you suggest in this low interest rate environment? What could you suggest as a okay investment? Not a conservative investment because it's not guaranteed, uh, you know, but what, what would you suggest to a 70-year-old man for a good investment uh, for some of his money? Why don't you start? You know, I would take kind of an insurance perspective on this. I know you're going to talk specifically with regard to the type of structuring of a financial portfolio to meet their needs. But um, one of the concerns that many people have is, are they going to have enough money to retire, to really live a long, healthy, active lifestyle during the retirement years? And that's really important these days, simply because we're almost on a daily basis, we're seeing enhancements in medical medicine and so forth that's kind of pushing life expectancy out further and further to in the 80s and 90s. And I mean, how long will it be before it's commonplace that we see people celebrating their 100th birthday? <laughs> okay. So one approach for clients is to really help them create an extra level of monthly income. This is guaranteed monthly income that lasts for two lifetimes, kind of like Social Security, but it's 100% for both husband and wife's lifetime. So when you couple that approach with Social Security and any pensions, it's structured to be able to meet all of their current living expenses. Very good. My first suggestion would be more in the ETF category. ETF stands for Exchange Traded Funds. Uh, they are basically, they're like a mutual fund, but they're low cost, and they typically track an index. So when someone says, what should I do with, uh, you know, let's say it's $50,000, and they're 70 years old, and you have to find out an awful lot about them, there's a lot of questions, risk tolerance, and all that, those kind of things. But I'd say, if you're 70 years old, use a function of 100. Uh, then you should, if you're 70, you should put 30% in equities. If you or you could say, how long more will I, do I think I'm going to live? Well, 30% in, in equities. So if they had, let's say for easy numbers, $100,000, I'd have them put $30,000 into a global ETF. That'd be, and keep the $70,000 always separate. I'm a big fan of separation, always in a separate account. And so that's your, you know, that's your, maybe you'd have a short term fixed income, or even if you had it in cash in these days, you know. Mm -hmm. So again, uh, exchange traded funds, they're very inexpensive things to invest in. Uh, and based on a, a 70 year old person, I would have them just put 30% of it into a global exchange traded fund or mutual fund. You can also do a passive uh, index fund. It's inexpensive. It, I guess it, it comes, comes from my old institutional world uh, of, uh, you know, selling inexpensive products so that most of the money goes back to the investor. Uh, now that 30% is at risk, but anyway, I think you understand. Why don't you take the next one? Well, I was going to ask you, I know in today's, we've, we're seeing historic low interest rates across the boards and uh, even more recently, a lack of Federal Reserve policy to, to start bumping those rates up. Um, I think a lot of us expected huge increases in interest rates, mm -hmm. which would have an impact on the portfolio, but we're not seeing that. So what would you expect for a rate of return on the, on the configuration you're talking about? What, what, how would that compare, that's let's a, say, to a, a CD? It's a very good or? question. The 30% that's in global equity should get 10% over time. All right, and it, you know, if there's other fees associated with your, your financial advisor, it's going to lessen that amount. All right, so that's that portion. 
the rest right now for five years is going to get nothing or next to nothing. So you're going to have a blended return of about 3%, mm -hmm. you know, maybe 2%. Uh, just do the math, 10% uh, of, of the 30, right, and then nothing or a 0% return of that safe money that might be in a bank account or something yeah. like that. But the $100,000, of course, 70000 is 100% safe, making no money, but that's what we have to deal with in this, this environment. This environment, yeah. What we, do, we have to be careful of is having long-term bonds during a period where interest rates go up. Uh, because if you understand how bonds work, you know, who wants a 2% a, a bond when interest rates are paying 5% mm -hmm. and the value goes down to that 2% you know, bond? So you want to, uh, you, you still have to be very smart. And again, if you, you do something like that, I think it's smart to talk to a CFP uh, and, and get, some, uh, get some real advice. Right, so. right. All right, second investment idea. Uh, you know what? I would say it's not investment. It's really protecting your assets. Uh, very good. Um, a lot of people as they approach, approach retirement are, uh, they're looking at the staggering cost of extended care. They're healthy now, 20 years away from retirement, but every day they're beginning to realize that's a concern that could certainly have a huge impact on what they've built up over their lifetime. Right? Absolutely. So um, the industry, I mean, the insurance industry has really developed a series of different programs to take on that burden. If, if you're, if you're going to choose to self-insure, that money is going to be leaving your portfolio, your estate down the road. But if we can put into place a program to help take that burden off your shoulders, that becomes a source of funds to be able to meet that possibility. Now, I'll also point out traditional insurance or long-term care insurance has been around for quite some time. But now, I guess the creative aspect of the industry, now they're kind of combining that with life insurance vehicles. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you might pay a premium for a long time, but if you never see the inside of a nursing home, this plan still pays off because it's also a life insurance policy. Right. So again, it's designed to be just a, a, a bucket of money that's going to be there for that purpose or at death. Great idea. Um, you know, I know you have just a few minutes left. Uh, my second idea for an investment for someone, again, if they're 70 years old, we're coming up with a hypothetical here, mm -hmm. 70 years old and they're uh, and they're in good health, uh, and they want to get a little bit something, you know, that's not going to be a CD or something that's not going to have a very uh, small return. Uh, I would just get involved in a balanced mutual fund. Uh, it's expensive, but you have professional management. Um, and I'd l I wish I could, you know, name some names, but because of compliance, compliance you, you know yeah. that we really can't. But a balanced fund means that there's a certain percent that's in stocks and a certain percent is in bonds. Uh, and you typically have a lot of people that are chiming in as to how this should be managed, both on the equity side, what they, sh what they own underneath, you know, what the underlying stocks and bonds are. But, excuse me, on the, you know, on the bond side, uh, they try to manage this interest rate risk as, as the interest rates are starting to move up and down. Um, so, again, if we go back to the, to the four ideas, we have a, a, an income idea, then we have an exchange-traded fund idea, uh, just uh, with pass mostly passive instruments, and you were talking about the very the, much the importance of long-term care. I was, but let, let me point this out. Yeah. One of the nice aspects that is, is kind of lost sometimes in the analysis is if you're able to create that level of income that is going to meet your current expenses, that allows you to think very differently about your investment portfolio, Absolutely. right? You can, you can afford to take on more risk. I'm not saying go crazy with risk, but bump it up a little bit because you have your expenses met. And now right. the portfolio is there in the future, whether it's to supplement your income, whether it's a legacy, charitable planning, whatever it might be. So those, they kind of go hand in hand, these two programs. Well, you know, you bring up something very important, the whole idea of financial planning and of looking at things in a holistic kind of way. Uh, you know, it's, it's very interesting you bring that up, Paul, because uh, I always thought that long-term care was especially important in a low interest rate environment. You're not giving up a lot, you know, in your bond portfolio. So perhaps what you should do is, is, is use a life insurance vehicle, as you're talking about, that right. has a benefit at the end that will pay you tax-free. It's one of the few tax advantages yeah. out there. Uh, and and it, just, it just seems to make sense as a, as a wealth protection kind of thing and a peace of mind kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so there's a, a lot of good ideas. I don't know how much time we have remaining, but I will say uh, there are situations where one spouse is unhealthy, needs this care, and the other spouse, called a community spouse, is very healthy, very active, just <laughs> living a normal life. And yet the concern is this person may end up, you know, 
causing a depletion of their portfolio. And now it's a question of how does a healthy spouse live over the next 10, 15, 20 years? It's, it's serious. Yeah. Yeah. Now we have a few minutes left. Let's have some fun. Interest rate predictions. Where do you, do you see interest rates doing in the next year? I see it going up. But <laughs> the question is when. Um, I, I think the consensus now, I think, is more of a slow climb over the yeah. course of time. And I'm not even sure it's going to happen beginning this year. But uh, Well, it's a crazy world out there in the investment world. You know, we have, uh, it seems like every month is something else. Last month we had China. Uh, you know, I remember three years ago we had a tsunami in Japan. Yeah. Uh, we always have a world event that's uh, kind of causing volatility in the market. Uh, with a lot of challenges in the world, uh, we have them now, and we always will have them. Uh, but I want to thank you uh, for, for being here. Any, other, any final thoughts before I wrap it up? No, I enjoyed being here. Thank you, Kevin. Well, I'd like to thank uh, Paul Redfern, again, CFP. Both he and I are both CFPs in the financial planning business. Uh, we're both based in Reading, or, or we both live in Reading as well. Thank you for tuning in. You've been listening to Community Conversation uh, at RCTV. We will be right back in a moment. That's it for this episode of Community Conversation. Thank you to Kevin Walsh, David Huey, and Paul Redford for joining us in this episode. And you'll be sure to look for our future episodes as well. Take care. Have a great day. Should